Claire here. <laughs> it's lovely to see you all and it's very nice to be here. I'm going to talk about change, creativity and innovation and what they mean for leaders in the media organisation. And my lecture is actually, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable, as Ethel would say, I'm disclosing my emotions because it's very applied and it's quite prescriptive. I'm trying to give a lot of advice for organisations, which is not really what we do in, in, uh, in institutions and research, but I think it's quite important for media management, which is an applied field. And what I'm going to be looking at today are the problems the old have with the new. And what I'm going to be, going to be looking at particularly is the problems that established media organisations have with new technologies. And Make, make some proposals for what they could do to change that state of, event, state, that state of affairs. And I'm going to kick off with some questions that I've been thinking about a lot. And that is, for example, why did Apple, a consumer electronics company, come up with iTunes when the music industry had been trying for at least 10 years to find a, a solution for digital downloading that people would pay for? How come Sony, who was associated with the Walkman, with movable music, not come up with the iPod? How was that Apple again? Why didn't Microsoft invent Google? Microsoft had a lot of the internet, it had a lot of software that it couldn't get into search. But again, why couldn't Google get into Facebook? And why didn't Disney invent YouTube? And you can see what I'm getting at here. I'm getting at this kind of repeated syndrome by which the leaders in one segment really established media organisations that we look to for having a lot of answers about how they manage their industries, who seem to have their act together, don't seem to have their act together when there is what we call the technology transition. And I've been trying to look at why does that happen, what can be done about it, and what specifically should the leaders of media organisations be thinking about. And one of the basic points, I think one of the basic arguments, is actually the technology is often not the problem. And especially if we look at, say, Google and Facebook, we can see that Google has such extraordinary capabilities in technology. That, that can't really be the issue. And often the technology competencies involved can be found out. It is possible to work out where the technology is going. What I would argue is that the challenge is actually lies inside the organizations and specifically in inside the state of being an established organization. And the challenge is you have, you have a business devoted to one type of industry to build out a business devoted on a new field. And this is not an issue that I've discovered. A lot of very respected researchers in, in very august institutions have been looking at this for a long time. And particularly Michael Tushman, who used to be at Columbia and is now at Harvard, has, has come up with this basic syndrome that seems to affect um, established organizations when, there, when what happens uh, uh, is something called, that we call the technology transition. And essentially, all technology development follows the same way. We have a kind of stable situation with established technologies, and suddenly there's a transition, and something new comes in. That could have been electricity, it could have been steam engine. <coughs> in our era, and the one that a lot of us in the media management field of being researching has been the internet. So the internet comes along and that's what's called the technological discontinuity. The world is suddenly very, very different. And no one knows how that world is going to emerge. And after that technological discontinuity, we have this period of ferment where established players and new players are fighting like crazy to establish a beachhead in this new world. They're believing in first mover advantages. Very expensive, very unpleasant, very high tension, high emotional period. But eventually that will settle down and a dominant design will emerge. Oh, and my graphics have disappeared. But what we have here is, for example, dominant designs. Um, we can have iTunes, we can have Twitter, we can have Facebook. There emerges an industry leader and after that we have a period of what's known as um, incremental innovation, where people are, are innovating, innovation continues, but it's around a kind of an established industry order, and that's fine until we get the next technological discontinuity, when more often than not, all of these winners here will get knocked off their perch. <coughs> and the irony here is that a lot of the reason that the winners get knocked off their perch is because they are running themselves <coughs> extremely well, and they are being extremely successful. And this is a, a, um, a syndrome that has been observed 
in just about every sector of industry in just about every <coughs> geographical region. And it's something that, um, uh, for example, Clayton Christensen in the Innovators Dilemma looked at, particularly in the high-tech markets. And essentially, why do winners become losers when there's a technology transition? And as I said, a lot of it is actually to do with doing things right, doing things as we in business schools <coughs> research and prescribe. So if you, are a, if you are in a leading position in your industry, the assumption is you've got a successful formula. You've got a formula that works. And essentially, you try and perfect that formula. You try and do it even better. So you try and maintain your industry position by building on the competencies you've got, regular incremental innovation to serve your customers better, to make your organization run more smoothly, to use your assets more efficiently. And as you get more successful, and as business books are written about you, and as you appear on the front cover of Forbes or Business Week magazine, you get a lot of feedback that you're doing it right. And you begin to also get quite complacent about, well, we are doing things right, the markets tell us we're doing things right, our customers tell us we're doing things right. But the problem is somewhere in the background a technology transition occurs. So if we take, for example, the emergence of the internet in the mid-1990s, if you were Time Warner and you saw America Online somewhere on the horizon and you saw that kind of ungrammatical dribbling chat that was happening in these chat rooms and a lot of it was about stuff that a decent media organization shouldn't be dealing with anyway. It would be very hard for you as an organization, as the board of that organization, to say, this is the future, this is what we need to get into. And then again and again, when these technology transitions happen, they happen on the fringes, and the, the large uh, leading organizations in the field fail to notice the threat that this could become. And essentially, the technologies and markets shift quietly, and by the time they've realized how important that field is, it's almost impossible for them to enter it. The, 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 a new industry has been established, new business models have been established, and essentially they've locked themselves out, and they can't reinvent themselves in time. So what I've been looking at, and I've been looking at actually from the context of established organizations with established businesses and often established businesses that are doing very well in established markets, what can they do about this? Um, this is where I really get quite prescriptive, but it seems to me that if we look at these organizations, what they do a lot of is pull in experts from outside, people that really know what's going on and ask them for advice. They buy in a lot of external support, a lot of external advice. But often I feel the solution lies inside the organizations. And what we're looking at, I would argue, is probably a lack of creativity and innovation. And therefore, essentially what they need to do is release the creativity inside those organizations and actually provide a space for innovation, particularly innovation in terms of business model. Now, creativity and innovation are terms that we all use interchangeably, partly because it's very boring if we're writing about the subject to keep using the same word. But actually, if we look at the theories behind it, they, they are different research streams. And creativity really comes from the field of psychology. It's about what's happening up here. It's about how we come up with those great ideas that move, move things ahead unusual, surprising, novel combinations of things that really represent something new. And in the media industry, this type of creativity is very necessary. It's very necessary for kind of competitive performance. Media organizations have to be able to keep on finding new, unexpected, exciting concepts that audiences will watch, that readers will buy. And they need to be better than competitors. And especially in an era of technology transition, you need a lot of creativity to work out how can these technologies be used to produce the kind of content we've always produced? How can we meet market needs or meet new market needs with this technology? Now the interesting thing if you spend time inside media organizations is most of the people are working there because they love that content and they are really very, very keen to be able to work more creatively. What you often find is that the way the organizations are run that there isn't much space for them to be creative. They enter the field wanting to be creative, but actually they don't get much time to do that. So I think in most media organizations, we, get, uh, we have large, <coughs> untapped, latent reserves of creativity there. That's a resource that's there that can be used. Now, innovation, actually, if you trace back into the roots of that, that research stream has its base in engineering. 
And this is really, the creativity and innovation are very tightly intertwined. intertwined. The creativity is the kind of the bright spark. Innovation is all of the stuff, the strategy, the structures, the processes, the business models that are needed to make that idea come to life and in the market. And in the current environment of technology transitions, a lot of innovation is needed around business models. You can have an idea for how that technology can, technology transition can create a fantastic type of content, but then you've got to find a way of actually institutionalizing that, of turning that into something that can, that can be sold. And I would argue that's actually a much rarer commodity because that really, this trick of finding the business model is the point at which most leaders stumble, that most entrepreneurs stumble, most venture capitalists stumble, most private equity firms stumble. And, and I would argue the problem here is actually you need the dual mindset. You need to really have a kind of immersion in the content, in audience needs, but also understand the dynamics of the business you're trying to deal with. So what can be done about this? We've got a dilemma here, we've got established organizations, we've got a tradition whereby established organizations basically lose their pole position when there's a technology transition. Is there a way out of this? And I think they need to work on these two axes, these two arrows, increase creativity and find ways of being more innovative with the business model. And I think a lot of that is to do pretty prosaic things about what's happening, pretty prosaic aspects of the organization. Now, if we come to creativity, and this is a little diversion into creativity <coughs> theory, to get creativity, you basically need three things. Firstly, you need problem-solving skills. You need the ability to come up with interesting solutions to old problems. This kind of problem-solving skills, creative thinking skills, actually are quite easy to acquire. We can go on a course, we can read a book by Edward de Bono. Problem-solving skills can be increased, not learned long-term. You need to keep pumping them. But that's a problem that can be solved. Expertise is very important. If you're trying to solve a problem in a particular domain, you really need to know what's going for in that domain. You need to know what the people know, what's the state of knowledge. That, again, can be brought in, but in media organizations, it's normally there. But the third most interesting thing is, is intrinsic motivation, which in kind of new age books is called flow. <laughs> and flow is actually, for me, once I stumbled on this area of research about 10 years ago, and it really has made a huge difference to actually how I live my life. It's very interesting. Flow is absolutely critical. Because when we are in a flow state, that's when we're really fired up by a task, really engaged in something we're doing. So much so that we lose track of time. So that's a real key to your own flow states. If you are working on something you find very interesting, you look at the clock on your computer or on your wrist, and you see that two and a half hours have passed, and you haven't been aware of that time passing because you've been so interested in what you're doing, you are in a state of flow. The reason that matters is that when you are in that state, your brain's ability to handle complexity, to keep very different ideas in your head, find a way of resolving them, so to find solutions is at its highest. And if you want people to work creatively, you need to get them into the flow state. And then you'll start to get these great ideas emerging. And the, but the problem in an organizational context is this is a very, very personal reaction. It's very hard to, to, put, to say to people, if you want you in the flow state, get intrinsically motivated. And a lot of the research in this field has looked at how can we get people working in project teams who need to be more creative, how can we get them into flow state? And the fascinating thing is, it's not really about the built environment, it's not about giving everyone apples instead of PCs, or painting walls orange, or having people work at kitchen tables instead of desks, it's about very kind of prosaic issues to do with how you set up a task. So it's to do with, firstly, and it seems really a no-brainer, you ask people for a creative solution. You, you, you say, you don't just want a good solution, you want something different, you want something novel. How you set the challenge is, is part of that. And, and the classic example um, I use for this is BBC News Online. So Director General John Burt sees the internet coming and realizes that 
he was very persistent. He's very criticised in lots of fields. He was very smart about the internet, and he saw that this is going to be the third medium for news. And the BBC's identity is all about news. So the BBC is going to have to find a way to make its news work on, on the internet. So the challenge he gave to the news online team, which was just 30 people in the beginning, is find a way to make public service news, BBC public service news, world service news, and all that means in terms of serving license fee pairs and having contact with people work on the internet. And that was the challenge that was very clearly defined. And if you look at other challenges given to inter given by classical media organizations to the internet divisions at the time, they were much more open-minded. So, you know, for Berthelsen, it was just kill Amazon, find a way to beat Amazon. But no, no real idea of how that could be. If you look at Vivendi, it was set up a mobile internet portal at a point when 3G wasn't really established. And those are creative challenges that are actually demotivating because they're too big. Um, so the challenge needs to be carefully calibrated. Resources also, what, what you'll see is you need enough money and enough time. Not too much. If you have too much, you get resources <coughs> and people lose focus. If you have too little, a lot of creativity does get to with finding more money, finding more time. <coughs> Team composition, very important. And here what you need is diversity. You need different ways of problem solving in the team. You need different types of expertise, different backgrounds, different experience. Uh, I remember talking to the person responsible for the Financial Times online operations, FT.com, and that got off to a very sticky start. And he said part of the problem was that in the team working on this, everyone had been to the same Oxford College. Everyone was a man of the same age with the same education. They approached the solved problem in the same way. They didn't have enough diversity. And the final issue is, that is autonomy. This team needs to be left alone to solve the problem. And the way Theresa Amabile, who is really responsible for this area of theory, presents it is you don't tell people which mountain to climb. It's Kilimanjaro, it's Mount Baiga. But they're completely free how they get up there. You do not interfere in terms of how they solve their creative problem. And if we look at BBC News Online, which is a very successful internet activity by an old media organization, Again, John Burton never physically visited the office. He never went in there. He followed it very tightly um, from uh, at it one remove through phone calls to through documentation. But he really tried not to interfere with how they solved their problem. So it, I checked this against a number of organisations, and, and what we see is that media organisations that are really do manage to be creative over the long run do seem to apply these set of concepts often unwittingly. So if we take HBO in the US, which invented series like Six Feet Under, The Sopranos, um, True Blood, Sex and the City, what we see in terms of encouragement, actually the HBO strap line is it's not TV, it's HBO. So the whole strategic identity is about doing things differently to the TV industry. The challenge they give to all the people that work there, and this is an industry that is really based on coalitions of freelancers. There isn't, the, you know, there's some fixed organization, but the rest is, is, is set. It's we want series that will get critical approval and commercial success. We want viewers, but we also want Emmys and Oscars. Funding, substantial but not over generous. They pay actually, they invest generally about a quarter less than their competitors in their TV programs. But what's very interesting is they give very long contracts to the key creatives, five years, in an industry where the norm is 18 months. And the reason for that is they want those people to feel safe enough to really push the ideas past the normal stage. I mean, what they'll do is they'll get the normal response, a normal product idea, and then they'll say, okay, go away and make this series a little weirder. It's normally what HBO is like. It's normally going off on the board founder somewhere. And in terms of autonomy, it's interesting, they are actually part of the Time Warner Empire, one of the biggest media organizations in the world, but they again have been allowed to be very, very autonomous. And Alan Ball, who is a, an Oscar-winning screenwriter, he wrote American Beauty, he also wrote Six Feet Under, he wrote True Blood, and he doesn't really need to work for HBO, he could earn a lot more money working in other places. You know, for Hollywood, but what he says is what he really likes about working for HBO is that low bureaucracy, and he describes it as your ideas aren't nibbled to death by ducks. You have a great idea, but it goes through committee after committee after committee. Each committee makes a small change, and at the end of it, 
this idea is really nothing like the original one. So that's really how media, established media organizations can come up with more product creativity. Let's look at this trickier issue of business models. Now, the basic recommendation here is actually to, to move to this concept of tasking the unit that's trying to respond to new technology, giving them a bit of space. Now, why do they need space? Well, basically, it's to do with the problems of trying to run old and new together. And the argument is that temporarily, at least, you need to free people of those considerations. Because if we look at business units within old organizations trying to respond to new technologies, they, they waste tremendous amounts of time trying to worry how this new business area is going to fit into the old one. <coughs> and one of the areas, the areas that are particularly problematic are a lot of those processes in the parent that to do, to do with running their organization well. So a lot of strategic control processes, like the balance scorecard, or resource allocation processes, actually really do make it very hard to invest in new areas. When you look at the new area, the new business model, it's not clear how they're going to fit in with the existing business, and for that reason, they often get rejected very early on. So the argument is, you give this new venture a, a time, not forever, where they are actually free from having to meet all those criteria. They're outside those processes. Clearly, should they get to the point where they launch their products or services, they also need some time to allow their audiences to build, um, to let word of mouth take off. I mean, this is one of the reasons. If you look at things like Monty Python, which um, 30, was created 30 years ago, still earning money for the BBC, that was a complete failure for its first series. If that had been produced by a commercial network, you would not have Monty Python. But because of the way the BBC is funded, because of the autonomy of its comedy division, it was allowed to come keep plugging away at this until it found its market. And this is going to be very important for creating new products and services because the audience is building. They're new to the world. People need to sometimes understand why is this going to matter. And clearly to experiment, to take risks, to get things wrong. And the goal of this structure is to try and set up a situation where you somehow combine the benefits of the startup, that freedom, that autonomy, the freedom to set up a new culture, with the resources of an established parent. So if we come down to leadership, what does this mean for people running media organizations, established media organizations? And this is what it seems to me is you come up with quite a complicated palette of skills, competencies, attitudes, character traits that, that need to be present in the leader. There is some hard stuff, hard skills, hard knowledge that needs to be there. So they need a very good grasp of changing industry dynamics. So if you take the media industry right now, what does the third screen mean? What does the iPad mean? Is this going to be a, a world-changing event? Is this, or is this an incremental innovation for us? So what you're talking about is a fairly new, an ability to judge technological change in quite a nuanced way. You know, if you look at one of the differences between telecoms and, and the media industries, the telecoms seems to go for the hype really fast and then often be disappointed because the markets they're expecting never emerge. And the media industry, in, in contrast, seems to be kind of pushed, kicking and shoving onto a new technological platform, moaning all the way. But the leader of the media organization needs to have some kind of knowledge about that, some kind of uh, nuanced understanding of the technologies that are coming down the line and how they could potentially shake up the world. But also understand the content. How can the old content work on the new platform? Will it ever? On top of that, because of the importance of all of the emotional, intrinsic motivation aspects, I think the soft aspects of leadership get very important. And really, then, you need a master of the kind of social architecture of the media organization, particularly an ability to shape the culture, to create a vision like John Burt. You know, old public service values, what you feel happy with, what you joined the BBC for on this new platform, and an ability to motivate intrinsically, particularly. And on top of that, I think at a personal level, you're talking a lot about confidence. And Confidence, because I think in this environment, if we're saying that growth is coming from fringe areas of the organization, from autonomous units, slightly out of the main, that shouldn't be controlled in the same way, 
We need a lot of confidence not to micromanage and actually to share power because in the, in the environment that's emerging, you see that a lot of the really great expertise is in the middle of the organization, in the fringes of the organization. That is where people have actually quite a lot of vision for what the technologies could mean for the established organization. And clearly the ability to handle complexity because you have you have a more complex organization, you have a, a, a central core that's about exploiting assets you've got, that's about synergy and leverage, and then you've got autonomous units around the side. And what we see is because this palette is quite a complicated bridge to handle, in a lot of the me leading media organizations or organizations that do groups of new technology, we do see collaborative leadership structures. We see two or three people running the leadership function who combine these different areas of skill and different personality aspects. And this again, once you start screening for this, you see this again and again in HBO again, as if there was a trio during the peak of HBO's most successful years, there was a trio. When BBC News was, more, was, was most successful, there was a duo in there. So what should leaders be doing? Just to pull this to a close, and again, as I said, to be quite prescriptive, which I, I realize as, as professors and researchers we shouldn't always do, but I do think if you're in the applied field, you need to think about this. I think for the media industry, first of all, I think one of the big changes, unlike the telecoms industry, they haven't really grasped that technology transitions are a fact of life. And they need to really focus on building organizations that are ready for these, that have the capacity to deal with it. Secondly, I think really understand the power of autonomy. And again, once you see, once Penny drops how important autonomy is in the media industry. What's very interesting is start to screen accounts of media companies. For example, Rupert Murdoch, who's seen of, to some extent as you know the, the dark lord of the media industry at the moment, has tremendous understanding for autonomy. And his key lieutenants in News Corporation in New York, in Fox TV in the US, in <coughs> Sky in the UK, are given tremendous autonomy to solve their own problems. He doesn't interfere. He sets the goal, and then he kind of steps back. In order to find autonomy, I believe that the, the answer is to create new business units around the fringes of the organization where people can experiment and keep it low key. If they are made too prominent, if they are celebrated as the future of the organization, something kicks in which Edgar Schein at MIT called autoimmune system rejection. The, the, the people in the unsexy middle of the organization who are generating the profits of start to really resent this high profile unit on the side that's getting all the attention and they'll start to subvert it from underneath. They'll start to kind of quietly kill it off. So the idea is you don't make this too high profile. Speed up the creativity pipeline, start fast prototyping. Larger media organizations tend to get very heavy and cumbersome with their new product ideas. Um, they invest huge amounts of time and money in developing an idea and then testing it. And then it doesn't work, and they've lost, they've lost a lot of opportunity. And this is something, for example, that like Google always does. It releases its products before they're quite finished just to see how they ride in the market. And this is actually something that the BBC has started doing. So, for example, with its children's programs now, it doesn't... It, Instead of doing very cumbersome, very expensive, long-term prototypes, it gets an idea quite finished and actually tests them in the local primary schools as a kind of first stage. If they don't make it past that hurdle, then they know that they need to go back to the drawing board. Fail more. You need to have an idea that if you're going to try more, you're going to fail more. But if you track back the most successful organizations, they have the longest record of failures, but they learn from those failures. And really, really important, give middle level people more scope. Often, I think one of the big challenges for the senior levels of media organizations at the moment is they really don't know as much as the middle levels of the organization. And, and some even something to bottom up. And I think what's interesting is that, uh, slight mistake there, what seems to me if I look inside media organizations, they do actually have basically all they need to master technology transitions, they just need to learn how to access it. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention.